Open your Bibles, please, to Luke chapter 1. Luke chapter 1. We will be reading verses 19 to 25. Verses 19 to 25. This morning, as we consider a sign for a people. Please stand for the reading of God's word. Luke chapter 1, verses 19 to 25. Thus says God's holy, inerrant, and infallible word. And the angel answered him, I am Gabriel. I stand in the presence of God, and I was sent to speak to you and to bring you this good news. And behold, you will be silent and unable to speak until the day that these things take place. Because you did not believe my words, which will be fulfilled in their time. And the people were waiting for Zechariah, and they were wondering at his delay in the temple. And when he came out, he was unable to speak to them. And they realized that he had seen a vision in the temple. And he, came, he kept making signs to them and remained mute. And when his time of service was ended, he went to his home. After these days, his wife Elizabeth conceived, and for five months she kept herself hidden, saying, Thus the Lord has done for me in the days when he looked on me to take away my reproach among people. Let us pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you for the wondrous feast before us spiritually. We thank you for your word. We thank you for the guidance in it, the clear and wonderful goodness of your word. Father, we thank you that we can go to your word and learn much at every stage of our spiritual development, whether we are children in Christ or youth in Christ or mature in Christ. There are depths immeasurable and goodness bountiful within your word. We pray, Father, as we get to meditate on these truths this morning, that you, by your Holy Spirit, illumine our minds, our eyes, our ears, everything, Father, about us, that as your sheep we may hear your voice, and obey it. We ask this, Father, in Christ's name. Amen. You may be seated. It is good for us to meditate on all of these truths, to get to speak of and see what, in the course of time, starts to get put aside what starts to be ignored in light of the truth of the inerrant word of God. We spoke last week of the sinfulness and the seriousness of unbelief. How even the mature, the righteous, the devout may fall into the sin of unbelief. And how it is that we learn from these examples in the scriptures and how we are to further lean on the veracity that God can do what he has promised to do. There are so many times that we see in modernity those that are supposed to be mature and those that are actually mature falling into the sin of unbelief. The very same people who know in times of difficulty and who know in times of duress that God is faithful, that God is true, may sometimes be the very same people that doubt that God can do anything. Well, I know God is sovereign, but I've had this affliction for the last 35 years so it's not likely that God wants to do anything about it. 
or well, I know God can do, but, but, but over and over again. And we have to be able to discern according to biblical standards what is happening, whether there is maturity in recognizing what God has done or whether we are facing a case of the sin of unbelief. And this is why I stress the reality that Zechariah and Elizabeth's case is not a quote-unquote blessing in disguise, but rather an affliction. So that when we get to seeing the words of Elizabeth, that God has chosen to take away her reproach, there is a genuine recognition of the fact that childlessness isn't hopping, skipping, and dancing in a field of flowers. And that the righteousness that they have exercised for decades has been a continual leaning upon and going forward in righteousness and obedience to the word of God. It's good for us to meditate on the reality of these things because it helps us understand how we are supposed to deal with light momentary afflictions and lifelong crippling diseases. It helps us to be able to say in all situations and in all circumstances, it is well with my soul. It is the very same thing that helps, for example, veterans like myself and Pastor Aaron to be able to take our brokenness with an extremely unnerving amount of joy in the Lord. Rather than being complaining, bitter people, we rejoice not in the fact that our bodies are broken, but in the goodness of the Lord for reminding us that without him we could not so much as do the normal things that we have done. Pastor Aaron has at times had such serious headaches or issues with a couple of his injuries that walking, that thinking can be difficult. And you all know that there have been several winters where I can't even speak or times where I can't sit or stand for very long. Being able to go through these afflictions, recognizing what they are and yet maintaining righteousness is what helps to sift immature from mature, righteous from unrighteous, and it forges within us a further character like that of Paul who was able to rejoice in his weakness because in his weakness the strength of Christ is made stronger. Sometimes, given the way in which charismaticism has permeated modern churches in the West, we have a tendency to believe and hear people who say, well, if God spoke to me or you directly, uh, that'd be an easy way to eliminate the problem of sin, of unbelief. I mean, if God just told you clearly, this is your lot in life and that's how it's going to be, uh, then that, that, should, that, should be, that should be it. Yet we know from the scriptures, the more sure word, that Gideon doubted. Even when being spoken to by our Lord. We know that Sarah and even Abraham had their moments of doubt given the realities of their old age. Even though the Lord himself spoke to them. As a matter of fact, Sarah even denied, no, I didn't laugh. I, I didn't do this, but you did. We even have a colloquialism from a particular form of doubt 
when Christians speak of, quote unquote, laying out the fleece. We see it. And we should see where it comes from. In Judges chapter 6, verses 36 to 40, Then Gideon said to the Lord, If you will save Israel by my hand, as you have said, behold, I'm laying out a fleece of wool on the threshing floor. If there's dew on the fleece alone, and it is dry on all the ground, then I shall know that you will save Israel by my hand, as you have said. And it was so. When he arose early the next morning and squeezed the fleece, he wrung out enough dew from the fleece to fill a bowl of water. Then Gideon said, Let not your anger burn against me. Let me speak just once more. Please, let me test just once more with the fleece. Please let it be dry on the fleece only. And on all the ground, let there be dew. And God did so that night. And it was dry on the fleece only. And on all the ground, there was dew. That's where the colloquialism comes from. Gideon, when faced with the reality of battle, doubted. Even, even with a multitude of people coming from the tribe of Manasseh, Asher, Zebulun, and Nephtali, even though all of these other tribes had answered the call for battle, he doubted. He said, I, I, you, you, I know you said that the battle's going to be won. I know they've answered and there's this entire multitude of people before me, but I need extra assurance. I need, I need just one more reason to be able to believe what you've said is going to happen. And let us not be mistaken, even as Gideon was doing this, you can see from his wording, he recognizes that there is sinfulness in his unbelief. In all these cases, we also see that the Lord extended mercy to the unbelieving people. We see it clearly in Gideon. Let, let, let your anger not burn hot against you. Just one more time with this fleece. One more. I know I'm wrong. I know I'm just one more time. Likewise with Abraham and Sarah. But we're old. And in my case, Abraham says, I'm almost ancient. How are we going to have children? And the Lord extended mercy. The problem is that because the Lord extended mercy to Gideon, because the Lord extended mercy to Sarah, and to Abraham, many Christians today believe that there's no consequence for their unbelief. After all, if God is just love, if God is just tenderness and kindness and mercy, there's no consequence for unbelief. After all, we were all unbelievers at one point, right? So they, too, can just lay out a fleece before God regarding what he had promised without consequence. And they proceed to do so constantly. Yet we've been able to see that it is a divine prerogative how the Lord responds to such sinful unbelief. Can you lay out a fleece? metaphorical sure recognize though that it is up to the Lord whether he will extend mercy or discipline in the cases of Abraham Sarah and Gideon the Lord gave mercy in the cases of Moses and Zechariah the Lord chose chastisement and what Christians in 2024 can come to understand is what God had already proclaimed, that he will have mercy on whom he will have mercy. There's never a point in the Christian life where we are getting from God 
what we deserve. Rather, every waking moment is a wondrous demonstration of God's grace to us in Christ. So, Christians shouldn't assume that God has to be or will extend the same graciousness for unbelief that he extended to Abraham, to Sarah, and to Gideon instead of disciplining them for the sin of unbelief. Remember, our standard of measurement is Christ. Our standard of measurement is the perfect obedience, the perfect faith of Christ, not the doubt of Gideon. We don't go and say, well, I'm not doubting you as much as Gideon did, Lord, but if you could just give me a sign, maybe if the next billboard says something about what I'm looking to do about this new job, I'll know that you're talking to me. We, we see it all too often in modernity where a brother or a sister gets labeled either a doubting Thomas or a doubting Debbie because they, they don't firmly stand on the promises of God. And yet, God extends grace and mercy. And there are others who are in the same spiritual stage of development who get instant discipline. What we need to reconcile and understand is that in both cases, God has given more grace than what was deserved. When we see that Zechariah is told by Gabriel that discipline is what he is going to receive for his unbelief, we have to make sure, it has to be absolutely clear within our minds that God is acting consistent with what he has said. That he is not somehow visiting discipline on a righteous man who walks blamelessly before his law as though God were failing in some regard. But rather that what we see here is a similar situation to when Moses, who should have known better, didn't believe what God had said. Zechariah, a priest familiar with the word of God, should have known better, and yet doubted. Dr. Sproul comments, to not just believe in God, but to believe God is the very essence of what it means to be a Christian. Back in the Old Testament, the prophet Habakkuk made the comment, the righteous shall live by his faith. Habakkuk 2, verse 4. We can translate it, the righteous shall live by trust. It is not by accident that this statement by Habakkuk is repeated three times in the New Testament not the least of which is in Paul's thematic statement of the doctrine of justification in the first chapter of Romans. It's not a coincidence that in the 16th century, this was the core issue between Rome and Luther and the Reformers. To be justified is to live by faith. To be righteous is to be righteous by faith. It's why the Reformers called faith the sole instrument of our justification. It's not faith plus something else. By trusting the Word of God and trusting in God alone for salvation, that's the only way anybody can be saved. End quote. So when we come to see these realities, we are to live by faith, alone, we understand even more, right, that trust in the Lord, we, one of my favorite hymns, trust and obey, trust and obey, for there's no other way to be happy in Jesus but to trust and obey. We are trusting in an inerrant, infallible God, his word which is preserved for us. And so to doubt is to sin. So when in his righteousness our God gives discipline for our sinful unbelief, every Christian in modernity can see the goodness of God in demonstrating exceedingly good mercy. 
in that discipline, just like he did with Zechariah. This is what David had spoken in the psalm. Your rod and your staff, they comfort me. It is to be comforted by the reality of God's staff correcting us and the crook of his staff leading us and directing us. Gabriel starts his rebuke by saying, I stand in the presence of God. The issue at hand was the veracity of the word that God had spoken to his messenger angel Gabriel over against the unbelief of Zechariah. Zechariah had heard the declaration and he responded with unbelief. But I'm old and so is my wife. And Gabriel's response when he said, I stand in the presence of God, really sums up or is summed up to basically saying, and this somehow disproves what God sent me to tell you. How? God is not a liar. God is just. God is great. And everything he says is perfect, holy, and true. There will never be capitulation to that truth in the face of any doubt from man. This is the veracity and the, the strength of the word we preach. It is the veracity and the strength of the word we herald and proclaim. Let the unbelievers break their heads as they bash against the bastion that is the word of God. But a believer shouldn't run head first into that same wall. Saying, but here's my human knowledge, thunk. But here's my doubt, thunk. This is why Gabriel begins, I stand in the presence of God. What I bring to you is divine revelation. It is truth in the absolute sense. So when discipline is pronounced before Zechariah. It is a good action. Because what was doubted was truth given from God. To Zechariah, who should have known the truth that was preserved for him to study all those decades. So, Zechariah is to be mute for his unbelief. Yet alongside the chastisement comes the reiteration of and the comfort of the fulfillment of the words that were delivered by the angel Gabriel. And this only serves for us to know the promises of God are true. They endure, they persevere, they will be fulfilled. Just as Peter said in 2 Peter 3, 9, the Lord is not slow to fulfill his promise, as some count slowness, but is patient toward you, not wishing that any should perish, but that all should reach repentance. He's told, you're, you're going to have the child. It's going to happen, but until then... You will not be able to speak. You will be silent. And of course, we've talked about the fact that not only is this event happening, but while this is happening, there's a whole crowd of faithful people that are praying for the deliverance, that are waiting. And they recognize something's not right. Something's not normal. And that's where Luke moves to next. And the people were waiting for Zechariah. They were wondering at his delay in the temple. And when he came out, he was unable to speak to them. And they realized that he had seen a vision in the temple. 
And he kept making signs to them and remained mute. Luke tells us that they were waiting. They were waiting for Zechariah to come out to join the other priests and offer up the benediction. Yet Zechariah was taking longer and longer and longer than normal time. Longer than what they were accustomed to. And it made them begin to wonder, what was the reason? What's going on? What is the delay? And then Zechariah finally comes out. And he comes out unable to speak. And he ends up gesticulating to the people there. Now, just a side note here. If you remember from our time in Advent a few months ago, the chastisement of Zechariah was more than not being able to speak. It was silence. You will be silent. You won't even be able to hear. Now that silence is good for us to note, and it's a detail that often gets bypassed. It's not that the angel Gabriel was reiterating, you will be silent and you won't be able to speak. As if those were both the, the exact same thing, but the reality that he could not hear and he would not be able to communicate. We'll see, we see this later on in verses 59 to 63 of chapter 1. And on the eighth day they came out to circumcise a child, and they would, they would have called him Zechariah after his father. But his mother answered, No, he shall be called John. And they said to her, None of your relatives is called by this name. Then they go to Zechariah. And what, what are we told by Luke? And they made signs to his father, inquiring what he wanted him to be called. Why make signs to a man that can hear what you're saying? Why gesticulate to a man who can understand what you say to him and then simply write down his response? They made signs to him, inquiring what he wanted him to be called, and he asked for a writing tablet and wrote, His name is John, and they all wondered. It's interesting for us to know that Luke records, he came out. He was unable to speak to them, and they realized that he had seen a vision in the temple. This information comes before, and he kept making signs to them and remained mute. Something was evident in Zechariah's demeanor that testified that something supernatural had happened far before he started gesticulating. Luke tells us that they realized he had seen a vision in the temple. You can imagine almost he walks out in absolute silence and the people in front of him are opening their mouths. Of course, they're saying, what happened? What took you so long? He can't hear anyone. He can't hear his own voice. He opens his mouth to say, I saw an angel. What? So he begins gesticulating. It's absolutely evident. Of course, some theologians speculate that maybe he came out and had a, a particular radiance from having been in communication with an angel that was directly before the presence of God? Is that a possibility? It sure could be. It sure could be. All we know is before he even begins to gesticulate about what is happening, the people know something has happened. A marvel has happened. As they were praying for deliverance, and the evidence that something had happened was before them. All of those faithful gathered that day knew something of great importance had just happened. They just didn't know what yet. Luke continues saying, And when his time of service was ended, he went to his home. After these days, his wife Elizabeth conceived and for five months she kept herself hidden, saying, Thus the Lord has done for me in the days when he looked on me to take away my reproach. And really, 
Verse 23 is like Nebraska. Because it's just flown over. It's ignored. It doesn't even exist in the periphery of the majority of people that read it. But think about it. Think about it in light of what we know. The man couldn't hear. The man couldn't speak. And yet Luke records for us this little tidbit that shows the dedication and the faithfulness of Zechariah even in the midst of of his chastisement, he continued and finished his time of service in the temple. And then he returned home. He didn't immediately go to his wife. He didn't capitalize on the fact that he couldn't talk and the fact that he couldn't hear. It's not like he asked for a wax tablet and wrote, hey guys, um, obviously, I can't communicate with y'all, so if you guys tell me, hey, it's your day to wash the uten utensils, Zek, uh, can someone get me a wax tablet? No. He remained. He continued doing what was required of him as a priest in the order of Abijah all the while, conscious through every interaction of the promise that God had made the role of his son, and the discipline he was under due to his lack of faith. The last words he heard were the words of the angel Gabriel. That proclamation is the last thing he'd heard and the only thing he could remember hearing as he's working in absolute silence. Let me tell you, that is not likely to be something easy. There's, there's, there's an entire thing about sound isolation. As a matter of fact, if you want to spend the money on it, you can go to a place and get put in a room that is absolutely silent. They cocoon you and you can't hear anything at all. Most people don't make it 10 minutes in such an environment. You don't really know how much you depend on your auditory sense to get around. And yet he remained working through that and then, then he went home with each passing day of his service, the reality of the promises made, of the coming deliverance, of him soon being a father, would constantly be driven home. Likely giving him the reason to continue to serve with silent gusto. It's a mentality that we don't stop to think about. And it's a commendable reality of those that are righteous. What do you do when you're in the middle of affliction? What do you do when God is disciplining you? You can do one of three things. You can try to turn away from anything about the Lord because He has disciplined you. You can be absolutely inactive and do nothing, just kind of curl up in a ball and say, well, I'll wait out this discipline. I'll wait until I'm no longer sick. I'll wait until this is no longer a problem. Or you can do what Zechariah did, and what we see is the fruit of those that are righteous and mature, and you can serve God in the middle of the discipline. This is an actual point of much conversation. What do you do when the Lord is disciplining you for a sin? Obviously, there's discernment, there's triage, analyzing which particular sin. Uh, if someone is an adulterer and they're the pastor, no, you're not going to let them step behind that pulpit again. You have to go through the entire process. But this is about the sin of unbelief. What if the Lord disciplines you for the sin of unbelief? 
you respond by continuing, by going, by doing exactly what James said, running to God in the midst of that fiery trial and working for the Lord in the middle of it. Luke tells us that not long after coming home, Elizabeth was with child. Joy, unspeakable, had come upon that household. Zechariah and Elizabeth, absolutely rejoicing in their old age. And yet Luke also notes for us that Elizabeth hid herself for five months. Five months! And he also gives us the reason for hiding herself for five months. After these days, his wife Elizabeth conceived, and for five months she kept herself hidden, saying, Thus the Lord has done for me in the days when he looked on me to take away my reproach among people. As we've spoken about last week, and as we've talked about, singleness is not a gift that God has given people to steward. It's not one of the talents. Likewise, childlessness is not a gift. It is not a talent. But as the scriptures clearly demonstrate, both are an affliction which the righteous and mature persevere through and endure. Elizabeth speaks of the reproach she had among the people because in those times, especially in her culture, most would assume that God was punishing her and Zechariah for a sin. Well, you've got to have a hidden sin that we don't know about, and that's why God is punishing you with childlessness. This is why it's important that Luke records for us that they walked blameless before the Lord and obeyed God's commandments. It demonstrates that this, this trial, this affliction, this stain, this reproach was there. Making it difficult for those around Zechariah and Elizabeth to see their faithfulness to God. The community was saying, well, you've got to be doing something wrong. So when Elizabeth chooses to hide herself away until it is blatantly obvious to everyone, until she's showing that God himself had taken away her reproach, that God had blessed her with child and thus vindicated her, she's echoing the words of Rachel in Genesis 30, verses 22 to 24. Then God remembered Rachel, and God listened to her and opened her womb. She conceived and bore a son and said, God has taken away my reproach. And she called his name Joseph, saying, May the Lord add to me another son. And in this too, we see the righteous character of Elizabeth who responds with praise and with recognition of both the affliction of childlessness and the bountiful goodness of God when she says, has done for me in the days when he looked on me to take away my reproach among people. It is the persistent seeking after God. Even in the midst of decades-long affliction, trial, and tribulation that characterizes the mature and righteous man or woman of God. When you find yourself in the midst of difficulties, remember that the character that God wants, the fruit that God expects from you, is righteous perseverance, faithful obedience in and through the difficulties. Simultaneously, we learn from the people around Elizabeth and Zechariah because we are encouraged and exhorted in the word to encourage one another to love and good works, to be involved in each other's life. 
but we are also not to make false judgments. We're not to be like the people here in the community that Zechariah and Elizabeth were, saying to them, well, you've got to have a, a, a sin that you're not telling us about, or God would not be doing this. We operate in the light and illumination of what is clearly revealed in the scriptures. And if we understand that either singleness or childlessness or a physical disability is not some kind of blessing in disguise, but is instead an affliction given so that those in it may persevere faithfully and righteously, we have the proper understanding by which to be an encouragement and not a further hindrance, not a stumbling block. It is one thing to rightly say to a young man or a young woman who in the midst of the confusion of the age says, well, I think I've been given the gift of singleness. It is good to say to such a person that does not exist. And what you're saying, you don't really believe. You go home and you feel lonely. And that is not meant because God has decided to keep you single and you better rejoice in that singleness. But rather, this is an affliction. It is a trial. One that may last long or one that may not last very long. But you are to strive for persevering righteousness in the midst of this. It is the same message that we communicate to the quadriplegic. It is the same message that we communicate to those people with various diseases who have had them from birth, who are blind from birth, who are childless. May God strengthen you in this that you may righteously persevere through this affliction. The sooner God's people in our day and age come to this realization, the sooner we can start to more rightly encourage one another to love and to good works. That must come with an understanding of what that is. And in order to be the community of God that furthers the truth of the word of God, seeing these realities as presented to us in the Gospel of Luke further helps us to, as he said, have certainty concerning the things that we have been taught that we may walk therein. We close with the words of Paul in 2 Corinthians 13, verse 14, the grace of the Lord Jesus Christ and the love of God and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with you all. And all of God's people said, Amen.